Are you planning a trip to Grand Teton and maybe not sure what to do? Today, we are going to talk to you about all there is to do at Grand Teton, lodging, where to eat, how to get around, airports, just all those little nuances that you'll need to have a fantastic trip to Grand Teton National Park. My name is Cheryl, this is my husband, Matt, and we are co-founders of We're in the Rockies, and the whole purpose of our channel is to help people have amazing trips to the West. So welcome to Grand Teton National Park. You can see the Tetons behind me here. An incredibly gorgeous place. If you've chosen to visit, you've made a really good choice. So let's dive right into it here. First thing we're gonna give you is a little overview of what Grand Teton is. Grand Teton National Park was the 12th most visited national park in 2022. It sits just south of Yellowstone. At one point, they actually thought about making Grand Teton part of Yellowstone National Park, but decided it was kind of better just to manage this off on its own. And they are two very different parks, by the way. Love Yellowstone and it's scenic, but Grand Teton is probably more scenic park. Like it offers better photography and just scenery. And you're looking at something beautiful everywhere you are. Like this, this is what you see as you drive through Grand Teton National Park. There's one mountain range for the most part going north and south with Grand Teton, Middle Teton, and South Teton as the three Tetons. I call it America's Matterhorn. And then the valley floor here, you can see kind of all this flat sagebrush here. This is the Jackson Hole Valley. And uh, what's great about this is it's awesome for wildlife, like wildlife love environment like this. So you're gonna see a lot of wildlife here. You're gonna have the amazing mountain peaks. And then as you get into the foothills of the mountains, you're gonna get some gorgeous scenery. You can see the trees are turning colors behind us. We're here in fall. Oh my gosh, it is stunning. So, Heaven. okay, now let's get to the really fun stuff here. The things to do. Grand Teton is a very fun national park. There's a lot of fun activities to do. So let's go through a couple of these. The first one is Jenny Lake. Jenny Lake is this beautiful lake that sits at the base of the Tetons and it's like the crown jewel of Grand Teton National Park. Jenny, named after a Shoshone Indian woman. Wonderful story kind of behind the naming of the lake and, and her husband and all that. But the lake itself is just a huge attraction. So most people will get to the lake, they'll take a boat ride across the lake. It costs, I think, $20 per adult round trip. And then when they get to the other side, they'll do about a one mile hike to see Hidden Falls and Inspiration Point, which will give you a beautiful view of the Jackson Hole Valley. You can hike around the lake. You can spend some time just on the shore of the lake. It's just a nice place to spend pretty much an entire morning visiting Jenny Lake. Speaking of Jenny Lake, there's actually a lot of water activities to do around Grand Teton and the area around it. What we actually like to do in the water, our number one favorite thing to do here is to go get on the Snake River. The Snake River runs through this park, but it also runs outside of the park. And the nice thing is, is you don't have to be like a big adventurous person to raft the river. Last year, we went on a, on a scenic flow actually through Grand Teton. Oh, we went on the sunset rafting ride and there were bald eagles in the trees and beavers on the river. Other things that are fun on the water is you can kayak and String Lake is so crystal clear, most beautiful views, but there's a couple other places you can kayak or canoe. And so getting out on the water here is really fun. Another little adventurous thing you can do is ride your bike. This is such a bike friendly park. They have an incredible trail system and they even rent e-bikes now, which I think is amazing. E-biking is awesome. It's like changed the game, I think. And especially for like a lot of older people, like Cheryl's parents are retired and have gotten into the e-biking craze. And everybody around here we're seeing is just e-biking everywhere. Yeah, so like fun. yesterday, they they rode their bike from like the Gravant campground all the way up to Jenny Lake and they weren't having to deal with parking. And so I, I remember our family rented bikes from Dornan's a couple of years ago. And I loved it because they're just driving along just looking at the Tetons and through those beautiful aspens. Yes. Okay, now we're gonna cover two things that are kind of related, I think, wildlife and photography. So Grand Teton, as I mentioned earlier, has great wildlife here. It's most famous for the moose. Uh, we've seen a moose every time we come here and it never gets old. I ran into one yesterday at Dorna's, came right up to me and I was actually trying to get away from it. I eventually had to kind of go into the office <laughs> because it just kept coming towards me and all that it was so awesome. We ran into a herd of bison once in the middle of the road. It was so awesome. They were just crossing right in front of us, little babies and stuff like that. I mean, it was like the most perfect Western scene too. You think with the bison there and the Tetons in the back. Oh, and then we ran into this guy yesterday who gave us a video that he had taken of the ultimate Grand Teton video. It was seriously perfect. 
moose walking in front into the river with those majestic Tetons behind, like the scenery is off the chart. And that's the next thing is the photography. So we've been talking a lot about a lot of um, activities and things like that. Look, if you're if you're a little older, if you're maybe not able to do some of these activities in Grand Teton, don't don't worry. Grand Teton is still for you. It is we are bumping into multiple people here who are kind of recognizing us from our, our videos, telling us that they're liking Teton more than Yellowstone because it is so scenic. And so, you know, if you're into photography or you just want to go look at the scenery, there's several viewpoints. There's several areas that you can go to get these great views of the Tetons. One of my favorite memories is when we got up early and we went out to the Molten Barn and there were maybe 15 other people there that had gotten up early to watch the sun rise. So we're all wrapped up in our blankets, seeing the sun and it's hitting the Tetons and the barn and it's just, it's pretty special. And I'm not even a photographer, but just like enjoying it with my own eyes, I loved it. Okay, something else that I think is really special about this area is it actually has a nightlife. When we come here, we try to do all the experiences because we like to be able to tell you what ones are worth your money and what ones aren't. Mm -hmm. And so we, last night, we went to the Jackson Playhouse and we've noticed that some of these national parks will have these fun little playhouses on the, on the gateway town. And the Jackson Playhouse was awesome. It was built in 1916 and so it's this really old building and the theater's small. It only holds 300 people, but the, so cute. it's so cute. I'm sure we'll have pictures on here for you to look at, <laughs> but I mean, it's so cute. And the cast, man, they're from all over the country. So you've got some talent here and you can choose to either just go to the show. It starts around eight or you can come at six and have dinner before. And the dinner was like high class, fancy food. It was really, really good. But that was super fun. But if you don't want to do that, you can go like to the Bar T5. That's like a wagon ride out to the forest. And then they cook you a cowboy dinner and they sing and play their fiddle. Oh, the and fiddler was great. The fiddler was great, and but it was so fun. I mean, the other thing is just chilling around Jackson. I mean, I think people have like a pretty polarized view of the town of Jackson. They either love it or they hate the crowds, but it's kind of fun to walk around and see the silly t-shirts they have and just be on those boardwalks, look at those cool antler arches. And we like to get moo like ice cream at Moose is pretty good. Mm -hmm. There's a shootout in the summer. So, I mean, there's there's stuff to do whether you want to spend money or not, but there is a nightlife in Gratine Don. And if you drink, you want to go to the Cowboy Bar. That's a really big one. And the Silver Dollar Bar. Yep. We're almost done with the things to do section, but there are a couple of other awesome things that we've discovered as we continue to visit this place. So the next one is Teton Village. Teton Village is a ski village. The common tourist thing to do there is to take the gondola or the tram to the top. When it gets up to the top of the mountain, you can actually look over and see Grand Teton Peak from there, which is pretty cool. You're at over 10,000 feet high and you're at like 5,000 feet above the level floor here, the ground. And up on top of there, we got a waffle, like a, a, Nutella, a Nutella waffle waffle sandwich. Everything's From, finger food there. Like they don't do plates, they don't do syrup, but trust me, it's good. They, they kind of cut up so you can just eat it and they make all the batter down at the bottom and they have to like lug it up on the tram and then they make their waffles and that's the end of it. Another place that I've been talking about often in our videos because I liked it so much. It's called the National Museum of Military Vehicles. It's privately owned. Some really wealthy guy had this little habit of collecting tanks. Like his wife collects shoes, he collects tanks. And so she said, you got to do something with these at some point. So he put them all into this gorgeous museum, kind of walks you through several different wars in American history. And he even has like Japanese tanks and German tanks and Italian tanks. And there's more than just tanks too. It's a lot of military vehicles, but just an absolutely like amazing display. And I'm like so big that the ticket covers you for two days. And I can say, I do not care about tanks and military things, but I actually really like this. I could not believe the high quality of place. This is like Smithsonian DC quality. Then the owner actually will give tours himself sometimes. My parents were lucky enough to get that. And they said, if, if he's around giving a tour, stop what you're doing and go follow him around because he's amazing. Uh, one more thing you could do, go out to Pine Dell, Wyoming. They have a pitchfork fondue that we did there which was awesome. They have also the Museum of the Mountain Man. If you can't tell, I like history. So if you watched any of our videos, uh, I'm, I'm a history guy. I have a master's in history and taught some adjunct classes at the university. So I'm always looking for the stories and like the context and the background of the area. 
And so this is kind of where most of the Mountain Man rendezvous were held is in this area here. And you can check a lot of that stuff out in Pine Dell, Wyoming. So just so many fun Western adventures to be had here. And you know, I cannot believe we totally forgot to, we left something off of our list. Did we? Hiking. There is great hiking in Grand Teton. I, that's probably the most obvious thing. But what I wanted to tell you that's special about the hikes at Grand Teton, now you look at these mountains and you think, oh my gosh, I am not in good enough shape to hike the Tetons. But the truth is, is that these are not steep inclines. What they actually are is hiking through the valley to the lake that's by the Tetons. They are easy hikes that our children have done, our retired parents have done. Now, of course, there are more adventurous into the Tetons. I mean, in fact, rock climbing is a thing here, doing 10 mile hikes through the Tetons. I mean, there's good stuff to do that way. That's really not our style. We kind of like the easy, we like the variety and we like the easier hikes. It's kind of what we tend to do when we visit our national parks. So I'm just saying, Teton is a great place to go hiking and it's really not as intimidating as it looks. We have more fun stuff coming up, but right now we want to really get into the nitty gritty of getting your trip planned. So we want to talk about lodging. In fact, on this trip, Matt and I have been out here for four days and two of the days I'm checking out all the areas and actually having some specific hotel recommendations. We've yep. gone into so many of these hotels. First concept I think that is really important to know about is that this is not a cheap place to stay. It's an upscale cowboy town and lodging can be really pricey. I think I would say plan on spending around $400 a night in a hotel. So just know that it's expensive. The next thing I want to talk about is some things to consider when you're booking your accommodations. If you're wanting to be efficient, the best options for you is there's in the park lodging. There's probably like six in the park that are they're kind of doable. Options. Yeah. And in the park, it seems like baseline there is between three and $400 a night. They open a year in advance. So, and they fill up quick because like they're not more expensive than anywhere else around town. And you're right in the middle of the park. Mm -hmm. And so like, if you're about all about being efficient, these are great places to stay. And they're pretty basic amenities for the most part. They don't have TVs in the room. They don't have AC. A lot of these buildings are so old that they really can't even wire them to have microwaves in them. And so know that your room is going to be some pretty basic, but the pros of staying in the park is this, like, these are your views. You walk outside and you see that we were kind of surprised to find that of all the lodges in the park, there were what, like 40 rooms that had views actual views of the teeth yes like yeah. from your window we literally found the rooms yeah like we <laughs> know had... we know the rooms that have them yeah <laughs> so yeah that's in the park lodging other place that would be really efficient for you to stay at is jackson once again jackson's super expensive and it's crowded but there's a lot of options there and then on the outskirts of town there's kind of there's like Old Town Jackson, which we, we all think about, but Jackson's actually so big, there's like a TJ Maxx and a Target there. And so on the outskirts of town, there are more typical type of lodges, like there's a Super 8. Um, so some holiday chains, in. holiday, like some, some more type budget options. But I mean, I think Jackson is like $400 a night and up. But like, if you're all about efficiency and you can't be spending a lot of time driving, I'd say in the park or Jackson are your best bets. Yep. Okay, next one is the Dude Resorts, or the Dude Ranches, okay, in the resorts. So Jackson has a long history of dude ranching. So what happened is a bunch of settlers came into this valley, early 1900s, tried to tried to make a go of it, and the growing season is just too short here. So they didn't really do all that well, they kind of struggled. And then they kind of realized, hey, we could actually, instead of wrangling cattle, we could wrangle tourists. And so <laughs> they brought in the tourists to they're dude ranches, just tons of them around here. They are offering activities like horseback rides and river rafting and different entertainment options and things like that for people. So in the park, the two really, really expensive ones are Triangle X Ranch that you have to stay at for a week and you get all these horseback rides and entertainment and meals and, and stuff included. And then Jenny Lake Lodge, which is located right at the foot of the Tetons with the most majestic views of all time. But it's like a thousand dollars a night because it's all inclusive. Like that's per person. Then there are several though, resorts and things around the park as well. Some that are just in these incredibly beautiful valleys and areas. So if you're looking for a place where you can just kind of come and stay for a week or something like that and just enjoy the, the atmosphere and the environment and then make some day trips into the park, that's a great option. If you're traveling out here and you're not like in butt kick mode of seeing everything like in a couple of days and you just want to relax, uh, one option that we found, we actually stayed here on this trip. We, we moved locations because we were exploring lodging, but we stayed in the area of Victor and Driggs, which is 
a little over an hour away from the heart of Teton. And so like Victor and Driggs is like a 30 to 40 minute drive to Jackson. Victor and Driggs has a lot of like kind of bed and breakfast, um, smaller hotels. It was quite a bit cheaper to stay out there, but you do have an hour drive to and from the park. And so we kind of felt like if you were wanting a more relaxing, like these are like properties that have some, some acreage around them where you can just go outside, hang out. Um, we think if you're staying a longer time, that might be a good option for you because A, it's cheaper. So you're not having to pay that top dollar night after night after night. And then two, you may want to come into the park one day and then take a day off and chill in those small towns. Okay, let's wrap up this where to stay segment with camping. It is easily the most affordable option to visit Grand Teton. The camping around here includes in the park camping, which is run by the National Park Service. All those are reservable on recreation.gov. I think they're about $50 a night, depending on what you get there, but uh, a little more expensive for campgrounds, but way cheaper for this area. And then there's also several campgrounds that are run by the Forest Service that are surrounding the park. Most of the land surrounding the park is Forest Service land, and those are even cheaper, actually. So a lot of those are first come, first serve, so you just kind of need to, you know, get on and research those. Really beautiful areas around here. The two big campgrounds in the park are Gravant and Coulter Bay. They all, they each have over 300 sites, I believe, and uh, both are great. My, our preference is probably Gravant. Really, it's just a matter of preference. Colder Bay, you're more in the trees and near the lake. Gravant, you're more out on the flat sagebrush, but you're near the Snake River, so moose come by and visit you all the time. Probably more likely to see bears up at Colder Bay, but whatever. Neither one of them has direct views of the Tetons. They're actually both obscured either by trees or by a butte. So they're really sixes in my book. And uh, But camping is definitely something to consider if you can do it. The sites do fill up quickly. They open up six months in advance. So if you know you're coming, you've got your date set, like get on that six months before so that you can make sure you have the campsite. Now it's time to talk about something that a lot of you are really interested in and that I do too much of, which is <laughs> eating. The nice thing to know about food in Grand Teton is it's good. Unlike Yellowstone that, oh my gosh, we have tried and tried and tried. And really there's just not a lot of good things to eat in Yellowstone. It's so opposite at Grand Teton. Grand Teton is filled both in the park and outside of the park with delicious places to eat. Like it is a good spot to eat. So bring your appetite when you come here. It's wonderful. And so the other nice thing to know about eating in Grand Teton is you can get a great spot to eat with a view, like several options of places with a view. So I'm going to just run off a few as a list and I want to kind of tell you some of my favorite ones too. So like get your paper ready if you're looking for food with a view. So there's four places in the park that you can eat where you can get a great view. Starting off with Leek's Pizza at Coulter Bay. You can just grab your pizza, eat out on a picnic table, beautiful view of the lake and the mountains. Next is Jackson Lake Lodge. Also another spot, I think maybe one of the most beautiful spots. And the nice thing about the Jackson Lake Lodge is you can get a cup of coffee and go look at that, or you can have an expensive meal in the mural room. We, we've gotten breakfast there. A lot of times we'll do that just to save money. Get but, views, but save some money. Yes. Yep. And then of course there's Signal Mountain and then there is Dornan's. And I want to just tell you kind of something fun that we did on this trip that I love. Maybe there's two things I want to tell you. Okay. <laughs> okay. The first one was at Jackson Lake Lodge. Outside behind the lodge, there is the lounge serves that area. And so you can order a drink there. I just got a huckleberry lemonade and it was delicious. And we sat out there and we looked at the mountains and the lake. And I thought this would even be great for outside because you sit at this fire pit table. So it would keep you nice and warm. I think it'd be a great way to end the day and not too expensive because you're just, you know, getting a drink or an appetizer or whatever you want to do there. Our other special experience was at Dornan's. We love Dornan's and we go there for rentals and stuff, but every time we go there, the food smells amazing because they do like chuck wagon, but they also have a pizza and pasta spot. And so this trip, we were like, we're going to go try the pizza. And they have this great seating, this upper deck seating where you have to be 21 years or older. So, I mean, we love kids, but we also kind of love not being around kids sometimes. <laughs> and so you don't have to deal with the kids up there. <laughs> and our kids weren't with us on this trip. So we got an adult experience. So we got to sit up on this upper deck and it's just viewing the Tetons and the valley and with the and, moose right there. And then the moose comes out in the field. And so we're just enjoying our pasta and we're watching the moose walk around the field. It and epic. it was great. So, I mean, 
So we have a lot of memorable food experiences from like this trip and others. Like Teton really bring your appetite, it's good. So that's, that's if you want views from the valley floor of the Tetons. But what about up in the Tetons looking down? Well, we've already talked about some of these places. If you do the gondola ride up at Teton Village, you can eat at that fancier, I think they call it Peast. <laughs> Peast an restaurant, off -piste. an off-piste <laughs> restaurant. That's what they're called. The piste is the fancier reservation one. The off-piste is the grab and go. Um, and you can just sit out there and eat with these epic views of the valley. And then that top of the world waffles up at Corbett's cabin is awesome also if you take the tram up there. Okay, the other thing is just the town of Jackson. So it's just fun to be in the town of Jackson because it's a little old west town upscale, but you know, it's got all that old west theming there and it is fun. It's cute, very cute town tons and tons of places to eat there a common one is sidewinders because it's fairly affordable it is located just outside of town so you have to drive down there to it but uh, sidewinders is a pretty popular spot we enjoyed that big s pretzel there with their homemade marinara sauce and just to clarify it is in town it's just not in the in downtown the town. yeah yeah and then we loved our meal at jackson hole playhouse like it was delicious oh man the brisket there was great and then, uh, and then we did that Bar T5 chuck wagon cookout that takes you into the mountains that actually kind of departs right there from Jackson. Obviously several, several other places to eat in Jackson, so. And Moo's ice cream is really good. They're like, right where they do the Western shootout is Moo's and they have all sorts of good ice cream in there. It's a real popular spot. Yeah, so the shootout's every night at six, I think, uh, except for Sundays, no killing on Sundays. So you go, go grab an ice cream Moo's then watch the shootout, so. Even though there is a lot of really delicious food around here, we often just opt to eat a picnic. You can pick up groceries and there are picnic tables throughout the park, tons of places where you can have an amazing view and save some money. And one of my favorite things is to save your time. Anytime you go get something to eat, it kind of takes a while. And so if we are really trying to see the wildlife and get places, we often will opt for a picnic. Okay, now we've talked enough about food. We've worked up a little appetite. We're gonna have to go get something to eat after this video. So let's just you know plow through this so we can go get something to eat now. Um, next topic is getting here and getting around. Four airports to fly into. Well, there is actually an airport right here. We're actually standing right next to the airport here in Jackson, like right in the national park basically. So you can fly into here. Uh, most people though that are coming out, they're, they're gonna visit Yellowstone as well. So this is, you know, consider this kind of like a road trip even if you're flying in because you're going to be it's a lot of driving around through these parks okay so there's three main airports there's the bozeman montana the jackson airport here and the salt lake city airport in utah bozeman is closer up to the north end of yellowstone salt lake city is about four hours away from here jackson also four hours away from west yellowstone might sound a little far away but a lot of people do that because it's a bigger airport and you might save some money there People ask us, what's your opinion? What airport should I fly into? If you're visiting both Yellowstone and Teton, which almost everybody does, my advice is just to get the cheapest one. So when you account for the flight and the rental car, just go for the cheapest one. Any of the drives to and from the parks are awesome. You can kind of do a loop, depending on which airport you're doing, you can make a loop through the parks and get back to your airport. You can even do fly into one airport and leave out of another airport. Some people do that as well. So I would just recommend whatever's cheapest there. It's all beautiful country that you're gonna be driving through to get here. We did hear that the Jackson airport is kind of like super anal on the security here. And uh, and so that was kind of funny. Somebody was telling us about that. And I'm thinking it's because you've got two government agencies involved. You got the TSA and the National Park Service. So that's a double whammy. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about road trips now. So a lot of you are driving out here from the east or from the Midwest, and you're gonna be doing visiting several places at once or in one big road trip. So the big kind of trifecta here is the Black Hills in South Dakota. So Mount Rushmore and that area, which is one of our favorites, man, some of the most scenic drives. We love that area. And then to come out to Yellowstone and Grand Teton. Places to visit all along the way there is Cody, Wyoming, a really wonderful town. Cody's like the opposite of Jackson. They're kind of like rivals. It's like the real Wyoming versus like the glitzy Wyoming. Yeah, we say visit both. Visible if you can. Yes, of course. If you are coming from the Black Hills, you'll probably come into Yellowstone first and then down into Grand Teton. Now, if you're coming from like Denver area or from kind of Texas, coming, kind of coming up from the south, by the way, Denver is an airport we think is just too far away to use as a, a way to come visit Teton. But you might be flying in to Denver and doing a bigger road trip. Okay, so 
we have talked to some people who just go to Rocky Mountain National Park and then they wait and work their way up into Wyoming. And if you're doing something like that, you would come into Jackson either through Pinedale or through Lander. Pinedale's fantastic. We love Pinedale, the Mount Man Museum, the Pitchfork Fondue, all that stuff. You come in through that valley, it's really pretty. The other valley is Lander and Du Bois that we mentioned earlier with the Military Vehicle Museum. Also a very pretty valley. You can't go wrong with either one. So also if you're coming up from Salt Lake, there's like three ways to get over the mountains. What we think is the most scenic drive is through Soda Springs, Idaho. That is a nice drive. We actually are gonna do this drive four times on this trip because we had to take a trip home. So. <laughs> the other fun thing about that for me, being a history guy, that's actually along the Oregon Trail. So Soda Springs is an Oregon Trail site. They actually have this geyser there in Soda Springs that is a natural geyser, but they've actually hooked up to a timer. So there's the geyser there, and there's another little park called Hooper Springs, which is where all the Oregon Trail people would stop and fill up their water and drink the fizzy water. It's like natural fizzy water from the thing. So, okay, and then real quickly, lastly, once you get here to Grand Teton, you are going to need a vehicle. There's no shuttle system in the park, unlike some other national parks. Um, you're gonna have to drive around to get around. It does take about an hour to get from the south end of Grand Teton, like Jackson, up to the north end of the park. So that gives you an idea on how big the park is. Next, let's talk about just some little last minute details about preparing for your trip. The first thing is the weather. We're right here at the very end of September and it's actually perfect. Oh my gosh, we are in heaven. But something to know about no matter what time of year you visit, this is a mountain park. And so the temperature is going to swing 40 degrees every day. Yeah, like it's going to be 70 today, but this morning it was freezing cold. We could see our breath. And so just be prepared with lots of layers, your gloves, your hats. As far as like seasonality of like when it's cool to visit here, it's always safe to be here like June through September. You're not going to be running into snow and things like that. But if, if you're going outside of that, early May, it is possible for snow to be here. Same thing with like October. Like we've heard stories. We talked to the ranger and he's like, yeah, October 2nd, we had to close the park down. It was zero degrees and there was snow covering the place. Yeah, that's just kind of know about the season. Now, Grand Teton is actually open in the winter. They plow the roads and you can go through there. And then of course, Jackson is a ski town. So you can come here, the elk refuge, there's elk down in this valley, but but we think that September is definitely like the golden month to travel. It is so nice here. The crowds are, especially like later in September, the crowds have really kind of cleared out. There's still some crowds, but beautiful weather, just delightful. Now, as far as things to bring, I don't want to get too into the weeds on this, but there's a few things I think you should bring. One is a refillable water bottle. They are very into zero waste around here. And so like if you go to Jenny Lake, right by like the boat dock and where you go across, they don't even have garbage cans. They just really are not putting up with any sort of garbage. And so bring a refillable water bottle with you. They're very into conservation around here and it's just a good practice anyway. Some of the places don't have drinking fountains, but yes. they have the water bottle fill up. Yes, exactly. The other thing to bring is people are always wondering, what about bears? Do I need bear spray? And our little thing we do is we do carry bear spray with us. Now, we don't typically go into the back country where we feel like we could run into a bear face to face without other people around us and stuff. But one of my big reasons why I like to carry bear spray around isn't because of bears. It's because of other wild animals. Like Matt said earlier, like on this trip, he unavoidably ran into a moose yep. and moose are, moose can be mean. Like when someone we were talking to, they're like, are moose nice? And I'm like, no, moose can be pretty aggressive. Other things to kind of consider is this is high and dry altitude. And so like your, your skin may dry out, even like we live just a little bit lower altitude in Utah, but I feel dry here. I have to bring my chapstick, my moisturizer, just, and I drink a little more water when I'm here because it is kind of high and dry altitude. Um, mosquitoes can be a problem, so make sure you have bug spray. Bring your binoculars to see the wildlife. Yes. Bring your binoculars. I yes. Mean. Okay, next up is how long to visit Grand Teton. So number one mistake I see that people make is that they don't visit for long enough. They think of it as kind of an afterthought to Yellowstone. They come down here, they might only do one day as a drive through. Yes, you can drive through and see these mountains as you're driving through the park, but Oh boy, you'll be missing out on so much. So I would say you need to give it at least two full days to see the park. But if you have three to four, you can get out to do some of these other great Western experiences in Wyoming. And so that would be my recommendation there. Now, if you're watching this video, you're probably visiting Grand Teton for the first time. And if you're anything like me, 
you love getting information. You're, you're really wanting to get that information before you go visit these places because you know how important your time and your money is. When I go places, I'm always just spending hours and hours researching this stuff from all over the internet, trying to piece it together. And I often just wish somebody really knowledgeable had done all the homework and put it in one package for me. We have created our travel itinerary to be so easy to use. And one of the best features of it is the maps we put in it because it will give you a good orientation of where you're going for the day. We put time frames so you know how long things will take. This is not an app. It's not locked away on your phone, nor is it a book that you get in the mail. This is something that you can get immediately. It's a PDF file that is 30 pages long and it includes a step-by-step -step guide for how to see Grand Teton each day, like what you can do in a day and the best, most efficient order of doing it. If you don't like to hike, if you're not able to hike, there's a different option for you. We also have a lodging guide. Again, this is another PDF file that you will get in your email and it includes all the secret tips and tricks that we have learned exploring all these different places over the last two days. Okay, but that is not all. I used to teach history at our local university. So I spent a ton of time researching Grand Teton and I have created an audio guide for you. So as you drive around the park, I will tell you all about the stories. This is a three hour long audio guide broken up into different chapters that are really story focused. I'll tell you the story about the first mountain man here, John Coulter, who was probably the first European to see the Tetons. He was like the the Daniel Boone of the West. So several stories about the park that you can listen to while you drive around. And so we started our business in 2020. We're in the Rockies with the whole goal of helping people have an amazing trip to the West. We have loved helping people travel to the West. In fact, we've sold over 9,000 of our travel guides to help people plan an amazing trip here. We come here every year. We try to explore every nook and cranny of the park, the hikes, the activities, looking at lodging, all of those things. We've spent over $11,500 just doing research on Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park, just to make sure that we know the very best things to do. Many of you are probably also planning a trip to Yellowstone and we want your planning to be affordable. And so we offer a multi-guide discount. If you purchase two guides, we will give you 10% off automatically. You don't need to do anything special. Just when you check out, it will do that. If you're doing even a bigger road trip, like throwing the Black Hills in or Glacier, we give you 20% off of your three guides. And so if you're on a big road trip, we want to make it affordable for you. And to get these guides, all you have to do is go to our website, we'reintherockies.com and click on guides. And then you can see the guides we have. And yeah, pick up the Yellowstone and Teton one and bundle them together and get a discount. One of the questions we get a lot of times is, well, should I buy the guide now or should I wait until right before my trip? Because I'm not going to go on my trip for another year or two. And the answer is to buy it now because then it helps you prepare for that trip. The lodging books up sometimes a year in advance. And so you want to get this as early as possible so you can start to formulate that plan. Don't wait till the last minute if you can help it. As we learn and as we come back and try out our guides, we update them. And when you purchase our guide, you will get free updates for the next 18 months. And so you will always have the most up-to-date information on that park so that you are prepared for the little changes that are going on within, within the park. Now, if you're wondering what other people have thought in using our guides, I want to read to you a customer review that we received on our website. We used your Grand Teton guide last week during a trip with our daughter's family. 28 page guide provided more and better information than we received from the travel company we had used to quote plan our trip. The audio guides provided a lot of interesting additional information as well. Loved getting some of the historical background. We would certainly order your guide for any other trip we might take out west. Thanks for your efforts and expertise. Okay, so just to recap, if you buy the guide here, you will receive an email immediately with links to download. You'll be able to start planning your trip here in the next two minutes. And the links are going to be a PDF file that will have the itinerary, the daily game plan for when you visit the park. This is something that most people print off with them and they bring to the park. That's kind of what a lot of people like to do. That way they have it and they can read it easily. The second thing you'll get is that PDF file with the lodging guide. And we recommend using that before your trip to help you get your lodging for the trip, but you won't really need to bring it here with you most likely. The third thing that you're gonna get is another link with audio files that you will download to your phone. There's no special app needed or anything like that that you have to download. You can just tap the link and download these audio files to your phone 
You can even try them out before you go. You can even listen to the whole thing. Some people like to listen to the entire thing before they even get here because, again, these are story-based. If you are interested in purchasing our guide, you just go to wearintherockies.com and buy your guides. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is we actually have an employee, Becca, who does our customer service. I think a lot of times people worry that they say they're not very tech savvy. The process is very simple, but we've got you if you have a hard time. This is not just some faceless online thing. We are real people who really care that you have a great trip. So start planning your trip now. Thank you for watching. And until next time, go West, Young Traveler.